Hello, Gasaholics. I'm Hot Rod Bob, and you've got gas. It's a Tuesday edition. Well, maybe if you're watching it on Tuesday, but, you know, you can get this on YouTube, Sketcher, Apple, uh, Anchor FM, and many other sites, because gas is everywhere, and I'm glad you're here with me. All right, today we're going to talk about some compact cars, a lot of discussion about small cars and cars getting smaller and so forth over the years. And I just wanted to go into some of the compact history in the United States. Now, many people think the compact era began in 1960 with the advent of the Ford Falcon, the Corvair, the Plymouth Valiant, originally a Chrysler Valiant, and the Dodge Lancer, which became the Dodge Dart. The original Dodge Dart being a full-size stripped-down car. But it's not quite so. The first compacts in the United States were actually long before Ford and Chevrolet got involved. AMC, the Rambler, and remember the Metro. These were compact cars that came from a smaller, not one of the big three companies. Did it get noticed? Yes, but they were ahead of their time. People didn't want compact cars then. It wasn't until the import invasion started with Volkswagen, Renault. Yeah, Renault was here, folks. Those of you that don't remember, the Renault Dolphine had one of those. Cool little car, as long as you were a mechanic. Um, but anyway, the compact began in the 1950s. The first major, I guess you could say, company to produce a compact in the United States, and I'm talking about a compact car, not a tiny car. The tiny car, you go back to 1932 with American Austin, who built the Austin sedan, Austin 7, basically, on license from the British company in Britain. The more notable car from Austin was the Bantam Roadster. Again, not really a compact car. It was a two-seater, more like a sports car ahead of its time. But let's get back to the compacts. The first major I guess Willys could be called, or Kaiser could be called a major manufacturer, was the Henry J. Now, the Henry J was a small compact car, about the size of a Ford Falcon or Chevy 2 or a Plymouth Valiant. It had a neat fastback design, sold through Willys dealers, Kaiser dealers, Willys, Kaiser, same, same company, and Sears. But that's not what I want to talk about. Let's talk about the big three getting into this. Hi, Dev. How you doing? Dave Chess, good morning to you as well. All right, so let's talk about one of specifically, and that is the Ford Falcon. Now, that is a favorite of mine. I've owned about three or four of these, and they're fun cars. They were the basis for what became the Mustang in 1964, and later on, the Ford Maverick, using the same basic platform. This was a solid platform. It worked. Now, they upgraded it and changed it over the years, because they went from six-cylinder engines to V8 engines. But the Ford Falcon was introduced in 1959 as a 1960 model. The base engine, a 144 cubic inch six-cylinder, spouting a whole 85 or 90 horsepower, depending on the site you look at as to what they put out. The optional engine, 170 cubic inches, with a whole 101 horsepower. Now, again, these were brake horsepower numbers, and it's actually a little less than that. Brake horsepower being the engine alone on a dyno tested for horsepower. Later on, we went to the SAE net horsepower rating. That's when everyone got confused and said, oh, look at all the horsepower drop. No, there wasn't a horsepower drop. It was a different way of rating it. So the SAE net numbers, about 30% less than the brake horsepower numbers because net had all the accessories on, and that's where the horsepower was rated with the vehicle horsepower numbers after alternators and water pumps and everything, the whole nine yards. But that gets us a little bit off target. So in 1959, the domestic market, the big three, Chrysler, Ford, and Chevrolet, started introducing some compacts. Chevrolet is the most radical, the Corvair, air-cooled, rear engine, transaxle, smaller car, lower car, didn't really hit the mark. Now, they sold well, and Ralph Nader tried to kill it, and he actually didn't. It just ran its course. But Chevrolet even realized that the Corvair wasn't really a good competitor for the Ford Falcon, their main target. And the Ford Falcon spouted copies. 
from Chevrolet, they called it the Chevy 2 or the Nova. But the, the Falcon, again, is what I want to talk about. Falcon came out and was built in the United States through 1970 and a half. However, the 70 and a half Falcon was not really a Falcon. It was basically a rebadged Torino with a strange roof on it, and they called it a Falcon. The Falcon went away in its true sense in 1969. So it was built for quite a few years, and because of its popularity and serviceability, the chassis was used for multiple cars. The Maverick was actually the replacement for the Falcon. Now, initially when the Maverick came out, it was a two-door fastback style kind of sporty looking. They never really got the big V8 power, but Falcon did. Now, Falcon was introduced, like I said, in 1959. It took until 1963 before it got a V8 engine. Hi, Martin Chesworth. Looking forward to seeing you at the California Hot Rod Reunion. You're coming back in from Great Britain. And again, dinner's on me that night. You, you caught it last time, so we'll get you this time. But the Ford Falcon got the V8 engine in 1963. They won up Chevrolet again. They put the 260 V8 in the Falcon, two-speed automatic, which, mm, and it had a four-speed option, which made it fun. They called the car the Falcon Sprint, and it was a sporty version of what was later to become the basis of the Mustang. Now, in 1964, they did put the 289 in there later on. First cars came out with the 260. Chevrolet, late to the game. They brought the Nova in, but didn't get a V8 in the Nova until 1964. So the Falcon, still a step ahead. Now, the Plymouth Valiant was, well, initially the Chrysler Valiant, was the compact version there. The American market started changing, and people started seeing the imports coming in, so they wanted a smaller American car. And at that point in time, they preferred American or Canadian-built cars, because, remember, American companies... We're building compact cars, or building cars in Canada as well. Now, Studebaker jumped into the fray earlier than Generous Motors and Ford with the Studebaker Lark. They downsized their almost complete line of vehicles, basing it on the Lark, which was a small car. Now, when you look at them today, they're tall, they're high, but overall size was small. Now, the Plymouth Valiant was a pretty decent car, and they had some pretty good options on them as well. Studebaker had the Lark. Rambler had the American. Now, the reports I'm reading say it was a downsized car. No, it wasn't. The Rambler American started out as the Rambler American, uh, the Rambler, and it was small to start with. Now, Ford started looking at bringing in some of the cars from Europe, and they actually started bringing in the Angley in 1939, a very limited production, uh, limited selling. It really didn't go over well except with hot rodders later on in the 50s and 60s, as gassers. They tried the Ford Tanos. They did try the Cortina, and I've had a couple of Cortinas. They were neat little cars. They were on par with a Datsun 510, for example. But they really weren't the car that the American market wanted, and Ford got away from that. Now, they brought another compact car in, the Capri, based on the German, and, well, they sold it in Britain, too, compact car. It was very popular, but not as popular as it needed to be to compete long-term like the Ford Falcon did. Now, I started, I was co-founder of the Southern California Falcon Association, or club, here in California. We had well over 100 members at one point in time. They are still in existence, and they go strong. Now, Ford Falcon was a fun car. They had station wagons, two-door and four-door, Four-door sedans, two-door sedans, two-door hardtops, and, well, then they dropped the hardtop in favor of a stronger sedan-bodied car. It was a fun car. They had some great designs as time went on, and I really liked the Ford Falcon. There really isn't a Ford Falcon body style I don't like. Now, in the United States, Ford Falcon went away, as I said, in 1970 and a half. At that point, it was a rebadged Torino. However, in Australia and Argentina... That car stayed in production for quite a few years. The Falcon name stayed on until Ford discontinued manufacturing about five years ago or so in Australia. But the Ford Falcon was their lead vehicle. Now, they had various versions of it, none of them replicating what we had here in the States. 
but the early ones did. As a matter of fact, the first generation Ford Falcon body style pretty much stayed the same with some trim changes in Argentina until it went out of production in 1990. Australia, they changed the body style, went to a homegrown style later on, or it stayed that way for most of its life. Hi, Nicole and Katie. How are you doing this morning? Good to see you here. All right, the first generation Falcons are considered 1960 to 63. And for the enthusiasts, those are the round body Falcons. Those are the ones with the rounded edges. And they were kind of cool. I had a 1960, a 1962, a 1963, a 1964, and a 1965, but different body styles. I had a four door sedan when I was in high school. I had a four door after I got out of the service. I had a couple of Rancheros, a 1963 and a 1964. And then I had a Falcon Wagon, a Futura Wagon. That was my favorite of the group. Now, that was a 289. It was the top of the line wagon at the time. It had every option except air conditioning, which kind of was a downfall. And then someone put a whole bunch of money in front of my face, and I sold it. Mistake. I should have hung on to that car. It was a neat machine. All right. Ford also shared basically the Falcon initially with Mercury. Now, another catch to that, the original Falcon was proposed in 1939. It wasn't a compact car. It became the Mercury. Edsel Ford had used the name Falcon as a higher level vehicle. He really didn't think it went over real well. They changed the name to Mercury and the introduction of the car in 1939 the Falcon name got put aside. It was resurrected in 1959 for the 1960 model. Ford of Canada was producing these, and they called them the Frontenac. Now, the Frontenac name was also used by Chevrolet. Yes, the brothers, not the car company. The Chevrolet brothers started producing race engines based on Fords back in the early 1900s, 1917 and so forth, and they called it the Frontenac. Now, for some reason, Ford adopted that name later on for the Canadian-built car, and it was the Ford Monarch dealers that got this car. Now, Ford executive Robert McNamara, who eventually became the U.S. Defense Secretary, is considered the father of the Falcon. It was his idea to push this body style through and this type. And, as I said, uh, the 144, 170 were the first two engines available. They used Charlie Brown, the cartoon character, and Lucy from the Peanuts comic strip, and they became the uh, spokespersons for the Ford Falcon through 1965. They had pretty good economy. I know my 1960 was the only one I really checked the economy on, and I was getting 20 to 25 miles per gallon. I had a 144 cubic inch six-cylinder initially, then went to a 170 later on, and uh, I had fun. I built that car up. I hot-rodded that car just like everybody else does, but I was not available. Well, I, I didn't have a muscle car, car available to me. So the Falcon was a great starting point for hot-rodding. Even the Ford dealers had speed parts for them. Offenhauser made a three one-barrel manifold for them. Well, and that was kind of difficult because the Ford Falcon cylinder head and intake manifold were one piece. Unlike the Australian version and the uh, your, the South American version that had a divorced intake manifold from the cylinder head. They got more horsepower, and for some reason, that's what they wanted. It liked, and it's more traditional and more conventional in design. Ford in the U.S. used the integral cylinder head intake manifold as a cost savings. It could be cast as one piece with a little bit of machining. It was fine. Well, a little bit of machining, and you could put three carburetors on that long log manifold that was part of the cylinder head, and I did in high school. I had three carburetors on my little six-cylinder Falcon, and then it had a three-speed manual transmission. Hmm, interesting. No four-speeds were available yet. Now, they did come out with the Dagenham four-speed out of the Cortina and put that in the Falcons, too, but it was a very weak transmission for the amount of torque the six-cylinder put out. Still... I had the six-cylinder with a three-speed manual, and what did you do? You put a floor shifter in it. I got a Fenton floor shift conversion kit from J.C. Whitney 
and installed it in my car. I had a three-speed on the floor, floor shift. Now, positive traction was not really available for those little six-cylinder Falcons back then. So after the third set of spider gears that I had blown up, my boss at the gas station said he wasn't going to change them anymore. He was only going to do it one time. I took the ring and pin, the ring assembly that I got from the junkyard for $10, took it to metal shop in high school. That's when we had actual vocational training and shop classes. And I must have used a whole box of welding rod. And with the arc welder, I welded those spider gears solid. Redneck pause attraction. It worked. I never blew another set of rear gears again. But it was fun going around corners, hopping the inside wheel. And in the rain, that car would go every which way but straight. But, hey, I was cool. I had a lot career end in the car. Now, the round body Falcons went away in 1960, and the second generation came, and they called those the square bodies. That happened in 1964 and 1965. In 1966, another total redesign of the body, chassis stayed pretty much the same, came about. The Ranchero was part of the Falcon line beginning in 1960. It was part of the full-size Ford line beginning in 1957, but in 60, it became part of the Falcon line, and you had the first U.S. compact pickup truck. It worked, and I've had a couple of those too. I liked them. They were kind of nice. Last one I had, I built up pretty good, and with the six-cylinder engine, 200 cubic inches, I was able to shut down a couple of 289s very easily. Of course, we were highly modified at the time. Good morning there, Gene. How are you today? So the Ford Falcon kept on going, and the life of the Falcon, well, in the U.S., ended, like I said, in 1970 and a half, but it was replaced by the Maverick. Now, they could have just as well called that a Falcon and kept it going, but, well, they needed to revitalize the line of the compact cars. The Maverick replaced it with a new name, a new body style, but the same chassis, same compatibility of parts. Gene Bernicek, yes, metal shop. What's that? Yeah. Well, back then, you know, we had all those great shop classes, learned manual dexterity, and learned how to work with our hands and in some cases, possibly find a vocation. But that's another story for another day. So the Ford Falcon, a compact car from Ford Motor Company, car that goes down in history, and it was good. Bob Alderman, how you doing there? Good to see you watching. I'm Hot Rod Bob, and you've got gas, a flying version of the Ford Falcon. Hope you have a great day. Remember, like, share, and subscribe. You'll find us on YouTube, Apple, Sketcher, Anchor FM, and a host of other podcast sites all over the world. I'm Hot Rod Bob with your award-winning Gas, the Great American Auto Scene, a dot-com award winner and in the top 200 of automotive shows worldwide. Yeah.